Welcome to Cincy Reform Podcast. I'm Pastor Brandon, and I'm joined with my co-pastor, Pastor Zach. We are pastors at Westside Reform Church, a URC congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio. And today we have um, an important subject, but also a, a, a touchy one, uh, one that um, causes a lot of emotions on both sides of, of aisles and, and various um, ideologies, but it's the issue of abortion. Um, the issue of, of, of taking the life of, of a child in the womb. And, uh, and we also realize that there are different contexts in how we speak about this. So, um, you know, if I'm sitting down with a mother who had previously had an abortion, uh, that's going to color our conversation. And we're going to talk about forgiveness in Christ, and we're going to talk about redemption, and we're going to emphasize God's care and, uh, and all of these things. And it might sound different if I'm talking to a group of politicians in Congress about lawmaking and various things like that. And so we, we have to realize that talking about abortion can... Um, we can come at it from different angles. Obviously, the same truth is still being applied, but we can come at it from different angles depending on um, are, we, are we talking about it in a counseling session or am I talking about it with politicians? Uh, are we talking big picture society or the individual who's hurting? You know? And so obviously, context, I think, matters. And so I just want to kind of um, preface our conversation today with that. But Zach, are there any... Uh, I guess, foundational principles that maybe we should uh, uh, have, you know, in terms of some big, some big picture pillars that we should have uh, before we get into the kind of the narrow of it today. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we want to be first thinking about, as Christians, that we confess that our God is the creator of all things and the sovereign Lord of all things. And he created all things with a certain design to it. He created uh, men and women to have children together. So I think it's um, important to to note, you know, as you said, the baby in the womb. Um, you know, we didn't just say the, the embryo or the fetus right. or some impersonal thing, but baby in the womb, and that's a biblical thing. So, uh, for example, in um, Luke chapter 2, verse 12, um, the Holy Spirit is speaking about this newborn Christ laying in a manger. He's, he is a newborn. He's laying uh, in, in a manger, Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. And the word there in Luke 2, um, 12 is brephos, baby. And he calls this newborn Christ baby. But what's interesting is that in the previous chapter, in Luke chapter 1, verse 41... The Holy Spirit calls the fetus, calls the embryo, calls the baby in Elizabeth's womb, baby, brephos. There is no categorical distinction in the Bible between the baby in the womb and the baby out of the womb. So as the Bible is writing and describing uh, babies, whether the baby is inside a, of a womb or outside and newborn, the Bible gives it the very same word, brephos, baby. Um, so if you kill a baby outside of the womb, that's called murder. If you kill a baby inside of the womb, that's called the same thing because it's a baby. And there's murder happening there. Um, but throughout the, throughout the Bible, I mean, we see um, God is Lord of the womb. He opens wombs. He closes wombs. Um, he fashions. In fact, that's how Job um, described himself. So Job 31.15 um, said that, that God fashioned him in his mother's womb. Uh, the psalmist in Psalm 22, 9-10, says that God was his God from inside the womb. In Psalm 100, verse 3, uh, the psalmist says that it was God who created him. Uh, in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14, the psalmist says, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and won wonderfully made. Um, and even, like, even the, the prophet of Jeremiah, for example, uh, God says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. 
So throughout the Bible, we are set up to view God as sovereign God over the womb, over life, over babies. He's the one opening and closing wombs, knitting, fashioning, all of this beautiful language describing about what God does in the womb. And it is miraculous. I mean, even doctors are just jaw-dropped at the miracle of life and how babies um, grow and develop. And it's just, it's just an, an awesome sight. And, and, and so we can see why this beautiful language in Scripture uh, being used about being fashioned and knitted together uh, Zach, is there any anything else you want to bring up about uh, how the Bible speaks about life? And sure, yeah, I think that one of the things to note that I think is very important in Psalm one thirty nine, which you just mentioned, and you can also say the same thing about Psalm fifty one when David is confessing his sin mm-hmm. and says, "In sin I was conceived." He's not talking about his mom there because. He's confessing his own sin in Psalm 51, but he says, In sin, I was conceived. Or in Psalm 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, there's a personal identity between David, who's the psalmist, and David, who's in the womb. It's still I. I was there. And not only I was there, but I was conceived and born in sin morally culpable, even conceived in the womb. There's not some becoming human that occurs later because that that would have made what was conceived something else. Uh, That's what I was, but now this is what I am. But no, it's a personal continuity between that I who was conceived, that I who was made in the womb, and the I who was then writing the psalm. And that's important to state and, and to note for us there. But I also would uh, uh, point out as well that we don't just see this kind of language used to describe particular individuals within the Bible. Because some would say, oh, well, you know, that's just talking about that prophet or these special characters in the Bible. And, oh, this language of these special characters like David or Jeremiah or something like that. Well, you know, that doesn't apply to everyone. But I would say, no, it it really does. It's It's a window into the way God works. And one of the ways that we can see that this view of the unborn, that this is applied to all people, is we could go to Exodus chapter 21, verse 22 and following, where God actually made a law, a civil law, for the people of Israel, whereby if a pregnant woman was struck and that the child within her womb was harmed, then that same level of harm would be uh, brought upon the, um, the one who struck the woman. Uh, for eye for eye, tooth for tooth, burn for burn is the language used there uh, to, to describe the fact that, um, that to cause the death of a child or something less than death would be uh, equivalent to murder or something less than murder, depending on the degree of harm to which was caused to that child, that baby that was in the mom's womb. Similar to um, if in our day, if a pregnant woman is murdered, it becomes a a double homicide. Same basic gist. Again, because it's part of the civil law, that demonstrates for us that this view of the unborn is not just for that particular John the Baptist or Jesus or Jeremiah or David, that somehow those are special but other ones are not. But no, all um, who are conceived within the womb are indeed image of God and, and children and people and should be, should be treated as such. So Yeah, that's really helpful. And I, I just love you know how you brought up um, Psalm 51 and how David invites us. And he says, when I was conceived... Um, and, and there he, so we're getting this image of a fertilized egg, an embryo, and the word I. He's saying me, that was me. Um, and yeah, that's just fascinating. Um, and, you know, because there are some people who say, well, you know, um, I'm okay with abortion unless the baby looks like a baby. You know, when the baby looks like baby, then I don't want to kill baby. But if you know, before, when it's uh, embryonic, when it's a fertilized egg or something, who cares? But you know, here David is taking us all the way back to the moment of conception, and he's using that personal pronoun, I. 
So I think that that is pretty uh, significant. But Zach, maybe you can bring this uh, more pastoral. And so let's say um, somebody comes to you and says, Pastor, you know, I I didn't mean to have this child. Uh, I'm in my last year of high school, perhaps, or I'm getting ready to start college or some big thing. I did not plan for this. This is not my life. I I have all these big dreams, and now they're going to be altered, and I don't want to have this child. What would you say, or what kind of counsel could would you give? Hmm. Well, obviously, like you mentioned earlier, each individual circumstance is going to change how we provide counsel and speak about these things. I think that first we can certainly uh, spend some time to talk about uh, the fact that there are uh, unwanted surprises in life and that we all have those and this is ser- a very significant one and you can understand how this becomes a very a difficult thing to um, to, to uh, think about and to consider when one wasn't planning on something like this but I think it's also the kind of appropriate time to r- remind someone that the, the Christian life is not one that's to be lived according to our own story that we tell ourselves and our own dreams and aspirations for ourselves, but rather we see ourselves as those who die to ourselves and die to our dreams and die to our aspirations in order to then, through the life of repentance, to be lifted up in terms of the plans that God has for us and to note that even that God uses sin and even um, you know, premarital intercourse that brings about conception and uh, that something that is not according to God's will um, in, in terms of what God has commanded, it violates God's law, but that God uses those kinds of things for, for good. And so to, to have a, that child is truly at that point the good thing to do. And to love that child, although it was a surprise, although it wasn't the he or she is not was not actually desired, but the Lord has a point, has a point to that child, and uh, the Lord loves that child. And so at that point, it's time to, to begin to die to our aspirations and die to our dreams and to recognize that God has a, a better thing planned for us than we could ever plan for ourselves. Now, that's not to say that we just leave that woman to go on by herself and to not be able to finish high school as she might have wanted to in the, in the manner she wanted to or un- unable then to go to college because, again, we live the Christian life not as an individual dying to oneself and being raised up with Christ to live a new life according to his desires for us and dreams for us, but rather we do so in a community. And so I want to reassure that woman that as she's part of the church's community, that we are with her to help her, to support her in these kinds of things, in order that she can still go to, um, to, to, to go to high school where possible, to still be able to perhaps even go to college as she desired to, and that we'd be ready to join arms with her and to, to, to take the conversation from that point. Um, in some instances, it could maybe lead down a path toward uh, the idea of adoption, but I would hope if someone from our church came to us with that kind of thing, they would never even need to go to that point of talking about adoption, even though adoption is a, is a great, is a great um, a solution in many circumstances. But uh, I would hope that uh, the Christian community could rally around someone, mm-hmm. again, not excusing the sin that's been committed, but still to celebrate the image of God that's in that uh, unborn child's life. What are some of your thoughts, uh, Brian, on this topic? Uh, no, I think that that uh, that was good. I mean, yeah, that the, we we are the church, and so as somebody is coming to us confessing their you know their sin and also their anxiety for the future, that we can um, help, that we can kind of come around them, rally, celebrate um, life, and celebrate this covenant child. Uh, get excited about uh, his or her baptism and being brought into the to the the, the uh, Christian life in the church and. Um, seeing the body of Christ help raise this child in the faith. And so, yeah, obviously wanting to, to encourage that, but also realizing that an alternative could be adoption. I think that's helpful. Yeah. And, um, you know, one thing, too, that maybe might be helpful to talk about here is uh, thinking about some of those really tough circumstances that I think every time you hear people uh, object to our view of the unborn child, Everyone wants to escalate it to the worst possible scenario ever. What if? And what if this is a circumstance of rape? What if this is a circumstance of incest? And 
let's just like ratchet up to the highest possible, grossest possible yeah. extreme here when that's rarely the case. Maybe at times it can be, of course. Sure. Yeah. But let's just let's take the hardest yeah. um, circumstance here, and Brand. Maybe you can kind of address that for us. How might we address the circumstance of rape or incest, or maybe even something like it endangers the the life of the mom? Um, yeah. In rare circumstance, yes, sure. so again, but maybe you can help us with that to walk us through that. Yeah, so I mean, just kind of thinking through these things, um, the issue of rape, now that would be, I mean, it is it is a horrific uh, sin, a horrific thing that happened uh, to um, someone, and uh, and then, you know, to, yeah, I, I mean, to make matters worse, you could say, you know, here now they are, are pregnant with their rapist's um, child. And so that can cause so much pain, so much hurt. Um, but again, I think that we need to remember uh, that kind of first principle we talked about, the God opens wombs, he closes wombs. And so as you look to God and say, God, you opened my womb to this. You knit this child um, in the womb, and you see it from that perspective, and you see uh, not to uh, minimize the horrific sin that was done against you, uh, but understanding that this is a child um, that God has has given, uh, that God has given life to, that God has knitted and formed and fashioned and in the womb, and understanding um, that, I think, can be a helpful posture to take, uh, relying upon the church to help, um, certainly. Um, I think that, uh, and, and, and again, one of the reasons you don't want to kill the child is because you don't want to kill someone based upon the sin of the father. You know, if, if I um, stole something from a store, I hope that police wouldn't arrest my children and take them to jail. You know, that was something I did. I don't want my kids to be to be punished for that. And so uh, we don't want to kill the child because of the father's sin. Um, also, this could be a, a case where um, adoption might be a good avenue, a good alternative um, to, to adopt the child out um, to, you know, a, loving family. So that would be some reflections on, on rape. Um, uh, when, it, when it comes to incest, people are you know, usually upset because when there's incest, the child typically has a special needs. Um, and so uh, they would say, well, if there's incest, then the child's not going to be as smart. It might be, I don't know, it might have a deformity, might have an underdeveloped brain, something like this. Uh, but really that opens up to just killing off all special needs kids. Uh, we don't want to kill off Down s syndrome babies and, and, uh, and, and children that are showing um, signs that they are special needs. We want, you know, again, because of the fall, we have, uh, unfortunately, children that have special needs sometimes. And we're called to embrace those children, to love those children, not to say, well, you're not as smart as the rest of us. You're not as capable as the rest of us. Uh, you're not as mobile as the rest of us. So we're going to kill you. That doesn't, that doesn't pan out or make sense. And so um, we wouldn't want to, to say that. It's dehumanizing, isn't it? It is, yeah, for sure. It's saying, well, you're somehow less human because you're less functional, yeah. um, which is not the case. That's an image of God. And then the final thing, uh, even rare, as you mentioned, you know, the, uh, when the life of the, of the mother is being threatened. Uh, you know, the problem with that is a lot of times it's very speculative. It's dealing with probabilities. And, you know, we've all heard, had friends or heard stories where, you know, the doctor said, you know, it, it doesn't look good or they gave them a very kind of slim uh, chance for the child to survive or something like that. You know, I, I, we had a, um, um, uh, a Christian friend who uh, was counseled that, that, uh, that you know, it didn't look good for the child. We should probably just abort the child. And she said, of course not. I'm not going to do anything like that. And uh, the child's fine and healthy. And so we're dealing with probabilities. We're dealing with uh, best educated guesses at times. But I think a better posture, I'm trying to put myself in, in, in the doctor's shoes. I just couldn't imagine being a doctor saying, who should I kill? As a doctor, I would say, I'm going to try to save everybody and pray the whole time. You know, I'm going to say, try to save mom. I'm going to try to save child. You know, this is in God's hands. I'm going to do my best to save everybody. And we'll just be in prayer. Um, and that, I think that, that that's a good posture for doctors to have, for mothers to have, um, 
Any reflections? I think that's helpful. I mean, I think that um, as I've read on the topic a, a fair bit actually in the past, it seems like these this sort of um, life of the mother is practically never um, in, in jeopardy in the Western medically advanced world. And it's not something that we really need to be to, in theory, if that were to ha happen, I think that you could, you can certainly make that argument that that could be the only possible time where, um, something like that could be the, the case, but it's really not a realistic sort of thing, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's been a hard, uh, heavy episode this week, but we hope it's been helpful for you. We would encourage uh, our Christian listeners to continue in prayer that this great sin of abortion would be brought to an end in our culture. Uh, we might have differences in terms of how we think this could can be brought to an end, but it certainly needs to be brought to an end. Uh, may it happen. We join you in, in that prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, please um, don't just pray for pol political ends, though, only, but please also be on the lookout locally in terms of yeah. ways that we can in our own individual lives, in our own um, particular vocations, uh, bring uh, an, an end to this and uh, in, encourage people to um, uh, give birth to those children that the Lord has blessed them with because uh, truly we believe that life is beautiful and that human life is something to be treasured and celebrated. So this is the um, Sensory Reform Podcast, the sponsored by West Side Reform Church. Uh, we invite you to join us on Sundays, westsidereformed.org. Uh, thank you for joining us. We hope to, uh, to have you back in the future. Thanks.